People, welcome. It is Friday, the last day of GDC 2017. This is Achieving Two Worlds Every Year, um, how Magic the Gathering sustainably doubled its world building. Um, to tell you a little bit about who I am and potentially why you should care, uh, my name is Jeremy Jarvis. Uh, I am the principal designer of Worlds and IP for Magic. Um, my background is in freelance illustration. I was one of the last watercolorists, um, and I was hired in-house in 2005 as lead concept artist for Magic. Um, I failed upwards within a year to be senior art director for Magic and spent a decade in that role. So from Lorwyn to anything you've seen now, I personally art directed that world. Um, I commissioned and art directed over 9,000 cards. I was the sole art director for a while. So that thing you remember from the last decade, that great magic card, I did that. Um, that thing you remember from the last decade that you hate, screw it, I did that too, whatever. God don't give with both hands. So um, that is who I am, uh, why you should care. I don't know, they gave me a microphone for an hour, so maybe you shouldn't. On a related note, please rate this talk. Um, <laughs> it's, it's important to GDC, it's important to the track, it's important to me. So, full disclosure, this will be one of those oddly specific talks. So we are going to be talking about Magic the Gathering. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with Magic and our players are fans. Um, those of you that are other industry professionals, I know you don't make analog card games. We are going to be talking about Magic, an analog card game. And specifically, a lot of the examples are going to be about Kaladesh because that is the most recent public set and I can show you some behind the scenes stuff from it. So, while we're talking about world building and how we achieve world building, this is what the talk's really about. Creating and maximizing flexible solutions uh, to solve inflexible needs. The reason I didn't call the talk that was, holy God, did you hear how that sounds? So we're going to be talking about world building. So here is a brief history of magic in case you don't know. Magic was created and introduced at Gen Con in 1993. Its original genesis was as a way to spend time between games of D&D. &D. So 1993 to 2017, uh, someone at work helped me do the math. That's 24 years, 24 years of product releases. Let, let me help you visualize what that looks like. Each of these logos represents hundreds of cards to the outside world. Um, to us at Wizards, uh, it represents learning and iteration. Um, and this is the stuff from before when I started working, so let's talk about the better stuff. <laughs> I wanna say Cold Snap was not my fault. It was not my fault. I was there, but we were just following orders. So, <laughs> so over these 24 years, through all of these product releases, um, we have learned, we've iterated, um, and I want to talk about what magic is today and how we've grown through those 24 years. So here's what we look like. Magic is still a card game, we're a really great card game, but we approach our worlds as cinematic and immersive. We want players to believe in them and care about them and care about our characters. Uh, this is our quality bar. We have set it so high for ourselves and now people expect it and we love to deliver on that. We want to be world class in the way we look, what our look feel is, our world building, because we want to be in the company of the other great games we enjoy and are fans of. And we do this twice a year now. We build these worlds twice a year. So, I want to talk about some context around what that means, um, what it takes to achieve those two worlds a year. So, let's, let's start with the challenges. It is not blue sky world building. It would be awesome if the job was just twice a year create two crazy good worlds, right? That's, that's hard enough. Um, but it's not. There are constraints. The first constraint is the very fundamental nature of magic, um, the five colors of magic. Um, every world we build has to cover those five colors. It's a five up. There are land types. 
associated with those five colors of magic. That's magic's resource system. If there is a world premise that can't accommodate those five land types, we don't get to do it. Crazy fire elemental world, that's pretty cool, right? Are there islands? No, not gonna do it. It's just the nature of it. Other constraints, again, it's not blue sky. We are always working with a mechanical theme. Uh, we very much believe that magic is at our best. We are doing our best work when the world creative and the set's mechanics are lockstep with each other. Examples of those mechanical centers, uh, artifacts matter, enchantments matter, color pairs, big creatures, and you've seen the output of us working in these mechanical spaces. Artifacts in Kaladesh, enchantments in Theros, color pairs, of course, Ravnica and its guilds, big creatures, the Eldrazi of Zendikar. So again, we're starting with a, con a confined space based on trying to do the best creative for the mechanics for the set. I wanna show you our creature grid. This is a visualization of what we call the creature grid. This has to be solved for every set. The cards will demand it. Um, there will be small blue flyers in a set. Um, and just to kind of explain the constraint space, the, the squares that are X'd out, magic doesn't do those. Red no longer gets small flyers. We get medium and large flyers in red, dragons and whatnot. If an artist creates the best, coolest flying hydra in the mind of man and God, we don't get to use it because green doesn't get flying and hydras are green. So I want to talk about one of these boxes in particular, just to kind of talk about the constraints um, for Kaladesh. Let's just talk about medium-sized black non-flyers. Now typically, the default, the go-to, is vampires and zombies. But remember, we were, we were trying to do a specific thing with Kaladesh. It, it's optimistic, it's beautiful, it's brightly lit. Can you imagine? what zombies and vampires would have, would have felt like here. Oh God, who is that for? That makes no one happy. But that <laughs> it probably makes a couple people happy and <laughs> I can't speak to that. Um, so again, the, the cards are going to demand answers for that square. So for Kaladesh, we created a new fantasy race. We created the Aetherborn, which, you know, Kaladesh is about a plane of inventors that uses ether to power these crazy inventions. And as a result of that ether use, these Aetherborn are a living output of that cycle. And they are short-lived, uh, they are opulent, they're pretty selfish, which is why they're black, because they know they're short-lived. You can see that they kind of crumble away, releasing the ether back into the environment. So they're beautiful, they fit within Kaladesh, they're kind of romantically tragic, and more importantly, they are uh, very of Kaladesh. They fit the world cosmology. And all of that work, and it was a lot of work, that's one box. There are lots of boxes, they all have to be solved for everything. Another constraint, now that we're going to two worlds a year, it is more important than ever that we do what we call swinging the pendulum. So, starting with the open vistas and the beauty of Zendikar, to the kind of quiet, tight, claustrophobic dread of Innistrad, to the bright sky and optimism of Kaladesh, to Amonkhet, which comes out in a few weeks and I can't really talk about it, but it's not Kaladesh. We know it's important to change uh, the look and the tone of the settings because we need people to be excited twice as often now. We're going to two worlds a year, so we are constantly planning not only as we world build to keep it off the last world, but to keep it off the worlds that we're going to do. So we have to be deliberate with our spins. Uh, most of those are creative constraints or constraints given to us by the card set. Let's talk about a logistical one, simultaneous global release. Our dates will not move. There is no soft launch. There is no soft patch. We cannot move by a day because of this. We print magic in 11 languages. We sell it in over 70, 70 markets around the world, and it has to hit those stores at the same day. Um, our organized play system around the world, tournament organizers have rented venues, sometimes years in advance. Our dates are not gonna move. That's a very hard constraint. Okay, so 
With that pile of constraints in mind, let's talk about what our inflexible need is, right? We need to build two worlds every year. It is our release model. It is what the organization demands. Now, in order to do that, we need two of these here, a world guide. Uh, it is the world guide that allows us to ensure quality and ensure a vision across all of the cards within a setting. Because it is a global talent pool that we have built uh, to illustrate the cards, I don't think a lot of people realize that it is zero people's job within the walls of Wizards of the Coast to paint magic cards. We do not have an art studio set up. All of it is outsourced to this robust illustration pipeline of the most talented people that we can find to be our partners in bringing the worlds to life. So it is that world guide that allows us to fully utilize that worldwide talent pool. And we are constantly adding to that talent pool because we have to, because we're gonna make lots and lots of cards. So the world guide has to be rich enough and robust enough to cover the needs of all of the cards. Um, it is hundreds of concept illustrations and often hundreds of pages. It's not just for artists, it's for writers as well. And so it, it's not just a simple turnaround per race. We need variation and variety because because cards, because lots of cards, and that's not even, that's not close. That's close, but still not right. About 450 cards. A normal block needs about 450 cards worth of illustrated content. And remember that these are game objects. The art has a job to do. If you misread a card based on the art, even upside down and across the table, that can cost someone a game. And right at the kitchen table, that sucks. Losing a pro tour because of it is terrible. And so there is a real job for that world guide to do. It has to do a lot of lifting. All right, so let's recap what our needs are. We need two world guides a year. Each one has to cover 450 cards. Um, they are working from a constrained mechanical space. We have set ourselves a very high quality bar that we love and now players expect. Um, our dates will not move, and we have two concept artists in-house. We do this with two concept artists, and we've trained the organization to expect that pile of assets to happen in three weeks. So, let's talk about our solution. Our solution to all of those constraints and to all of the demand is Contractors, we bring in contractors just like everyone else. That's what we do. What if that was the talk and I just walked off right now? <laughs> so we do bring in contractors. We bring in five people for three weeks, but the real solution is our concept push. And so what we're going to be talking about is how we have learned to organize ourselves and to optimize our processes for this solution to be sustainable and successful. All right, so let's dig into that. Let's start with the simpler time. I'm nostalgic about this, when this was our release model and we only, only had to build one incredible world a year. What takes Hollywood six to eight years and a lot of games, two to four. We just had to build one a year. One world guide would cover three sets and then there was a core set that historically did not need concept support. So within that model, Let's break down our solution and how we've made it work. Let's start with Magic R&D's organization. We have our noble and righteous creatives. <laughs> we have our game designers. <laughs> uh, and both, <laughs> both of these halves of R&D report in to the same leadership body. <laughs> <laughs> and that's magic art. I might, I might really be in trouble right now. My, my department has not seen this. So, <laughs> so that is magic R&D. And the point here is our creatives are not a service department. We do not want a culture of handoffs. We are literally the same team and not in the touchy-feely we're all on the same team for magic sense, in the sense of 
We share bosses, right? That's the sort of integration we want for magic. Again, because we believe ourselves to be at our best when mechanics and world creative is lockstep. And this is the most fundamental visualization of us wanting to be that true, wanting that to be true. We are literally organized that way. Now, our process. Again, we want integration, not a culture of handoffs. Here is a visualization of our process. Now you start with a block concept that can be bottom up, like a mechanical desire, like two color factions, or it can be top down, like magic does Egypt world. Um, we agree on the block concept, and then both of those wings of R&D start working. And very quickly, we start sharing members between the teams. Uh, we have a design member on our initial world building team, then they move into vision design, we have a creative liaison on the vision design team. We are constantly informing and responding to each other and collaborating through the entire process. And yes, there are handoffs, like a process can only be so soft, but we are not a culture of handoffs. We want to be a culture of integration for the good of the product, for the fun of the player. So, I'm going to give you a couple examples of how this can potentially break down. It's a little bit of a cautionary tale. 2011, we introduced Innistrad to the world. Innistrad's mechanical center is Graveyard Matters. Uh, things going into the graveyard, coming out of the graveyard, being in the graveyard. And so it's creepy, it's gothic horror, there are vampires, there are zombies. So makes sense, right? Graveyard Matters, gothic horror. A decade before, another set had that same mechanical center. Odyssey was also Graveyard Matters. Things going into the graveyard, coming out of the graveyard, being in the graveyard. It was about pit fights and these uh, octopus people called cephalids and merfolk and an artifact called the Mirari. There were Avon and cartographers. Graveyard Matters, right? Now at some point, clearly, if you AB the two, uh, Odyssey broke down somehow. Uh, there was a disconnect um, from too many handoffs or not enough integration, and the creative and the mechanical center just diverged from each other. And it's not that it looks bad, it looks great. There's it's a lot of great art in Odyssey, but the world concept is certainly not lockstep with the creative center, uh, with the mechanical center. So they got a little lost and disconnected through that process. We don't want that. So phasing our own work, front-loading the problem space, this is where we in creative especially have really learned through iteration. Um, how much work of our own work, the work that we are going to do anyway, how much of that is healthy to front-load? And here's why it's important for the concept push. We, we have three weeks, we don't have time to shop. We don't have time to have that, I'll know it when I see it, art director attitude. Again, we don't have that art studio setup. If we did, okay, fine, that might be a great attitude to have. We don't have that luxury. Um, and so, we don't wanna be overly prescriptive to the artists, but we do want to know enough about our own work to set them up for success so they don't come in and waste time blindly swinging. And here's a healthy balance we found in what work is productive and healthy to front load codifying what magic's twist on the given subject matter is. Here is a real world example. Um, this is Amenket. Uh, people can hear the same word and get to different places mentally. Magic does Egypt world. Okay, we needed to codify that this is not dirty, dead, archaeology, tomb raiding world. This is a living, thriving, beautiful fantasy Egypt. Um, it is magic's take on Egyptian mythology and it is the stronghold of Nico Bolas. And so just codifying that so that people are able to jump in and hit the ground running. Also codifying what's off the table. What parts of a given genre or trope space are we not interested in seeing? Again, we have to be stingy with subject matter if we want to keep making magic sets, so we will take stuff off the table for future us. Um, a great example from Kaladesh is we wanted this plane of inventors where there's going to be a lot of artifacts, a lot of people, a lot of artifact creatures. We wanted that to be about innovation and optimism, not about a rise of the machine story. 
And just saying, a plane of inventors that create artifact creatures, it, it would be very easy for people's minds to go there. We went ahead and just nailed that down on the front end. Don't bother making cards about that. Don't bother drawing pictures of it. We're, we're not doing that here. What fantasy races populate the world? And why? And this really goes back to that creature grid. Um, we try to make those decisions up front, whether there are elves here or Naga, what they're doing, what are they about? Um, what is our white uh, non-human race? Is it Leonin? Is it dwarves? Are they in red? Are they in white? We need to make those decisions instead of being like, I don't know, you know, we'll know it when I see it, feel it out, maybe elves, maybe not. And I, I don't mind telling you that we used to make that mistake. That's why we've learned so much about this. The attitude used to be, hey, words are more flexible, more responsive than art is, so let the artist come in and do a bunch of impressive work, and then the writing will cater to that. And what we realized iteration over iteration is we were wasting a lot of time, sometimes we were frustrating the artists, and we ended up, after the concept push, still having too much work to do to get to a hard stop. And so, that is one of the conversations we front load, making decisions about the cre creature grid. This one's related. Uh, what groups are here and how are they awesome? Uh, a lot of times we have creative super types, whether that is a guild or a clan or a faction. Um, and the way we approach setting artists up for success so they're not blindly swinging without being prescriptive because we don't want to tell them what to come in and draw, right? If, if we wanted to say Boros is about pointy helmets and curvy swords, we could be working with much less talented people to get those results. We want to be working with the most talented illustrators that we possibly can, and we want to give them as much freedom as we possibly can, but at the end of the day, we, we still need our worlds to be our vision um, and we still need to make sure that our needs are met. And so we talk about and front load what these groups are doing, what they care about, what their role in the world is. So we can talk about Boros through the lens of kind of righteous military and let them solve what that means visually instead of wasting their time talking about curvy swords. So that's mostly what we front load, and that takes us to our first milestones to set ourselves, our first milestone to set ourselves up for success, which is the kickoff document. This is, this is literally a picture of the Kaladesh kickoff document. Um, there is, it is not an impressive achievement of technology, but it is a great achievement of thought and us, again, front-loading the work that we're gonna do anyway. There's also a presentation, and it's, it's what we use on the first day of a concept push to present to the artist, to compel them and excite them towards our vision of the world. Um, because the more invested, you guys know this, any given creative is, the better the work they're going to do. So we give them as much freedom as possible, we give them the kickoff presentation, and let them start working. So, this is where we start to create a feedback loop. Uh, we use that global freelance talent pool to staff these concept pushes. So I, I'm gonna talk more about the feedback loop later, and I don't mean feedback loop in the like healthy communication with time to pivot sort of way. I mean feedback loop in the audio sense of when the microphone becomes aware of its own output, when the originator of a signal becomes aware of its own output. So re remember the feedback loop, we're gonna talk more about that later. So we're going to bring in five artists for three weeks. They're going to be our partners in an incredibly important phase of making magic. So here is how we maximize that concept team. Certain worlds have needs that others do not, and we're able to cater those five slots to specialists that can address that problem space. A great example is Ravnica. Ravnica is a plane covered entirely by city, um, and so guess what you need? A lot of artists who are very comfortable with a lot of architecture. Um, we can even add people if we need to. So again, this is where the flexibility of the concept push concept really starts to come into play. We are able to ensure team culture, uh, which is important. Again, like it's because we are drawing from our freelancers, 
it's been college since a lot of these people were in a collaborative environment. Some of them have never been in an office environment. Um, and it's been a long time since they've stood at a wall with other people and received open feedback about their work. So it's really important that the people we pick are gonna give us this sort of culture and not this sort of culture. So if we have two illustrators that we think might not get along, we just don't bring them in at the same time. We get to make those decisions on a case-by-case -case basis. We get to mitigate other challenges um, simply by who we're able to bring in. Like, just think about communication. Because we are bringing in partners, partners from around the world, not all of them speak English as their first language. And that's fine, we just have to be aware of it so we don't invite too many people at the same time and get into a scenario where they are literally having trouble communicating with each other or with us. We are very deliberate about who comes in when uh, just to avoid potential issues. And once we have made the decision about which five people are correct for the setting, that is our second milestone. We have hopefully created the optimal concept team for that particular world, for those particular challenges. At this point, we have either set ourselves up with the right people to be able to come in and hit the ground running, or we haven't. It is a milestone. So let's talk about how we structure those precious three weeks. Week one, free exploration. After we give the concept push kickoff, that document and that presentation, we let them just explore whatever spoke to them, whatever excited them, regardless of what their specialty is, regardless of what we thought they were going to do. First week is free reign. We get a lot of weird stuff. We don't end up using a lot of it. Uh, but it can lead to the lightning strikes that we don't ask for, that we didn't know we wanted. And again, we're bringing in very talented people for a reason, and we don't want to stop those lightning strikes for happening. So the first week, free reign. Second week, we start to tighten up some. We need to start to force the world to take shape. This is an actual picture of one of our concept walls. This was back from, looks like, the Theros concept push. Um, and we have our first tyranny pass, where the art director um, has to apologetically go and start to take stuff off the wall that's not working. Um, we start making decisions about materials and shape language. Uh, we start to take design motifs and uh, really loudly um, bless them to be spread across more assets so that we start to work towards a unified world vision. Week three, we get tactical. We start to give assignments. And as you all know, artists love assignments. Um, <laughs> regardless of, <laughs> that's Eric Deschamps, regardless of that funny picture, it, it really is a very positive process because after, you know, it, it's just kind of tightening that funnel of starting very broad and tightening up, and they understand that by week three, the challenge is now to be heroic. I need you, talented artist, to solve what a dragon is here for me. I need you to fix this thing that isn't quite working yet. And they really step up to that challenge. Um, so week three is tactical assignments, and at the end of week three, we hit our third milestone which is the resulting pile of concept art. And it is a pile of stuff, it's a lot of assets. Um, and at this milestone, the world guide is either set up with the quality and the content it needs, or it's not. So there is a cleanup and finalization stage where our two in-house concept artists take the reins and really start doing the edits and bringing things in line with each other and filling holes. And this can go on for some months as we really unify to ensure the quality and vision of that world guide. Because the world guide is our fourth, final, and most important milestone. When the world guide's done, the product, the cards, our artist pool is either set up for success or it's not. Um, so that that's the process that we've iterated on from Lorwyn through Cons of Tar Tarkir. Um, and that simple life ended with Cons of Tarkir. <laughs> then the need changed. Our product release model moved from this to this. Um, two 
two set blocks a year, each with its own creative. So what that meant was our inflexible need, which was only one incredible world guide to populate hundreds and hundreds of cards with world-class assets, turned into two of those. We needed to do it twice. Um, without sacrificing quality, uh, we don't just get more time, we don't get to double our head count, and we had to figure out how to accomplish this and how to accomplish it sustainably. And so our new flexible solution was uh, our old flexible solution. We just do it twice. It's a flexible solution. It's scalable. Like all of those learnings that allowed us to do it once in how much is healthy to front load, how our organization should work, um, how we avoid uh, a, a culture of handoffs, all of those things work. It scales. We just have to take ownership of it. It did create a new problem. This cleanup and finalization phase, we used to have months to do it. Um, and our concept artists no longer had that luxury. And so we needed to find a new way to get to a hard stop faster so that we could start front loading that healthy work for the next push. And so in order to do that, uh, our concept is still scalable. We just did it more. So we have a small push after the push prime where uh, three artists come in for another three weeks and help us get to that hard stop. This has led us to further customize who we invite in and when. As an example, we bring in more international talent for that primary push and we have learned that uh, a really great thing to do for that follow-up push is bring in more local artists. We have a lot of our illustrators, several of them, are local to the Seattle area. They've been working with us for years, and they're able to come in. They understand that it's a different challenge, um, that the challenge is to clean up and edit and help us get to that hard stop. And we have really built that relationship with them so less communication is needed. They understand the job. They understand what they're doing. And they come in and just take a hatchet to it, knock it out of the park. Um, so a flexible solution will scale. That's literally how we do it. Solving it for the first time, solving it when it was just once a year, was actually much harder, much harder than scaling it once we knew what we were doing. This is tangential, but it's worth talking about. The concept push as experience design. There is a potential pitfall in this wonderful flexible solution. That pitfall is it depends on freelance illustrators, very talented ones, right? Those freelance illustrators have all the work they want to do. They owe us nothing. They can say no, and we need them to want to say yes because we want that level of talent in-house. So. Beyond the normal niceties of being good people and picking them up at the airport, and we are, all of our creatives are good people. I am the worst of us, I'll just tell you. But, you know, we hang out with them. We take them on hikes. Uh, I never leave the office, but allegedly there are cool things to do in Seattle. There are trails and a mountain, and Fraser lives there. So uh, we play rock band with them. Um, we, I'm pretty sure this is illegal. That's too many people in one car, but they really had a good time. And we, <laughs> we get to know them outside of the office environment. They get to understand our culture inside the office environment. We get to know them personally, and you know we have a sense of them from working with them, out, uh, outsourcing art. We certainly know their talent. We certainly know their reliability. We, we have a pretty good bead on whether or not they are personally a sociopath, but we get to spend that face time with them, and because of that, the concept pushes have become a stealth hiring pipeline. It was, it actually used to be a stealth hiring pipeline until this presentation. Of our... <laughs> Of our seven art side creatives, five of them have been hired through this process of being card illustrators, being brought in on a concept push, and then when we had an opportunity to add to our organization, we're able to just reach out to someone who's been part of this weird, wonderful process that we do a couple times a year, and knows us, and knows Wizards culture, at least in broad strokes, and uh, it, it's worked very well. Three of our four art directors came out of this and both of our in-house concept artists. So let's look at that flexible solution 
and how it has come to inform that feedback loop that I was talking about earlier. When the originator of a signal becomes aware of its own output. We have this organization, a well-structured organization of Magic R&D. Magic R&D's job is to make cards, lots and lots of cards. Because we're gonna make lots and lots of cards, we need this robust global talent pool. Then we mine that global talent pool to pick the perfect five partners to come in and work with us for three weeks on a concept push. And that concept push outputs a world guide, and that world guide is used to make cards, lots and lots of cards, because we have an organization that makes lots of cards, and so we need a global talent pool, and then we use the concept, and so on. And then, when we have an opportunity to add to our organization, the concept push is our recruiting ground. And so, we have this entire system where because we have chosen to do the work this way, over time, the work becomes easier and more sustainable to do. So I'm gonna pose some closing questions. Um, one of the exercises, it can be a little frustrating, but I really enjoy running, is when we figure out something that is true for magic, either an aesthetic value that we care about or a way of doing something or a process or whatever it is, when it was counterintuitive to get there, but we got there and it works really well, try to backwards engineer what the correct question would have been to lead us to that answer had we been smart enough just to ask ourselves that question. And so were we more clairvoyant here are the questions we could have asked ourselves to get to these answers to this process that is working really well for us. I will ask them to you. Can your organizational layout better reflect your desires for the product? This goes back to that org chart. Um, we have the same bosses because we want the creative and the world concept to be fully integrated. Can you better phase the work that you own to set the next phase up for success? The work that you own, that you're going to do anyway. I'm not talking about organizational revolt. The, your sandbox, can you better set the next phase up for results just based on how you approach and phase your own work? Can you find a sustainable answer for problematic annualized needs? The concept push used to be a crisis for us, and it happened every year. If it's going to happen every year on schedule, there is no reason to let it be a recurring crisis. Figure out how to sustainably meet that thing. It should only be so miserable to make games that make people really, really happy. Find a solution for annualized needs. Where can you introduce a flexible solution within your inflexible production cycles? How can you fully maximize every ounce of that flexibility? And this really is the last one. If you don't take anything else away, I would really love for you to think about this, whatever your discipline is. Where can you answer a need with a process or pipeline that fortifies itself over time? Again, that feedback loop. Are there places where you can set up systems, processes, pipelines, whatever, that because you have chosen to do the work that way, over time, it becomes easier to do the work that way. So with that, we have some time. I want to open this up to questions. I would love to answer anything you guys have to ask. All right, guys, this is the last day of GDC. Um, I know that every hour at GDC is a major decision, a significant time spend. Um, there's so much talent here and so many things to learn. I really appreciate you spending one of those hours with me and with Magic and with Wizards of the Coast. Thank you. Oh. Oops, <laughs> you're backlit, sorry, great. Um, hi, thanks for such an insightful talk. Um, as an aspiring producer, it was great to gain insight into how you manage your art pipeline. Um, my question is, you said that your company 
um, is very specific in your timeline. So do you ever deal with crunch time, like what you have to release on this certain day? So what do you do if you're not quite there? Do you have to, how does that work for you? It's going to release. <laughs> no matter I, what. It's, it's going, yes, yes. We have not missed a street date since, I, I don't know that we've ever missed a street date. So the real answer to that, what do we do with crunch times is, again, we have lots of reps in this. We release a major block product every three months. So if you hit a crunch time more than two or three times, we try to accommodate with a new process or a new way to phase the work. Um, I believe that all great process is versus something. Like, you know, I'm not smart enough to just be like, in the abstract, here is the perfect process to accomplish this. But I know what I don't like seeing happen over and over again, and we will pivot and figure out the best way to accomplish that work. Um, yes, crunch times can happen. A lot of that pressure comes from our desire to work up until the last possible moment on the development of the set. We're trying to get as much real world feedback on the play environments as possible. So while we would, in theory, just love to start earlier and earlier, we need to wait as late as possible to get that real world feedback for our best development for the set and the good of the play environments. Um, and so there can be crunch times, last minute changes, sometimes cards change to the point where the art no longer works for them. We have to call in favors to our friendlies in that art pipeline. Um, so the answer is try to see it coming, don't let it happen. If it does, suck it up. That's why it's called work and not happy fun time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, let's go over here. Hey, yeah, thanks. That was an uh, absolutely kick-ass talk. Um, Thank you. I was wondering, so it feels like you've really refined this process for this one game over a very long period of time, um, and it seems like that's a well-oiled machine at this point. I'm wondering um, how easy do you feel it would be to transplant those exact learnings onto another game? Um, or do you think this is, this is exactly how this one game works and this is the perfect process for Magic, but other games are gonna have to take 10 years to figure out a process this good again? So, I, I think it is a very good process for Magic. And the reason that I kind of audibled at the beginning of this is like, people, it's gonna be weird, oddly specific, is because I, I don't think the way we phase stuff, the way we whatever, I, I do think those questions at the end are good questions to ask yourself. But every game, like D&D, &D, we're in the same building. They have very different processes, different needs. We do share learnings back and forth. Um, uh, sometimes we share team members, but we make things in very different ways. And if we're making things in different ways, on the same floor of the same building, I'm certainly not foolhardy enough to stand up here and be like, I've solved this for all of you, all of you. All you need to do is bring in five people for three weeks. Thank you. <laughs> so it does work very well for us. I, I'm not claiming it's perfect yet, right? But it's working well and we are able to consistently ensure that quality without it being a, a, a weeping, gnashing of teeth meltdown every time. And so, I. For the time being, I'll take it. <laughs> cool, thank you. All right, thank you. Hi, uh, my question is about how this uh, very well-designed process is integrated with uh, R&D and uh, mechanics. Uh, like how early, for example, do the mechanics have to be set in stone for art to start? Or is it all happening at the same time? Or Sure, that, that is a good question. Um, and the answer changes from setting to setting. Um, we have what is called arc planning, where there is a cross-functional team of us that uh, from different disciplines within R&D gets together and decides what the product lineup will be. It used to be the five-year plan. We always had a five-year plan. We knew what settings we were going to, whether that was top-down. It's finally time to do um, Greek mythology, or it was bottom-up, uh, like uh, we want wedge factions. Uh, that five-year plan, once we doubled our world building, became a five-set plan that no longer gets us five years. But coming out of arc planning, uh, we know kind of what the heart of the set is, whether that is a creatively driven heart or a mechanically driven heart. So to answer your question, if it's a mechanically driven heart, like uh, Khans of Tarkir, where it was, we don't know what the creative is, but it's going to be five wedge factions of some sort and we want to do a draft matter set, so it should probably be time travel. It shouldn't have been time travel. But that was the answer. <laughs> Never, if you are a creative, 
Never, ever tell a time travel story. It's so miserable. <laughs> it's really, really hard not to ruin your whole thing. Um, so we will often have that much information if it is bottom up. If it's top down, we know less. And that vision design process starts iterating on mechanics. And that's why we are constantly informing and responding to each other. A lot of those mechanics get thrown out, just like a lot of the concept art gets changed or doesn't make it through to final. Um, but we are constantly aware of when something's working really well and uh, design sometimes will come over to us and be like, we, we nailed down a mechanic. It's really good. It's really fun. Can you build around this? And we say, no, screw you. Like, just because it's fun. We're, no, we say, yes, let's build around that. Turns out we want to make fun games. Um, and conversely, when we're like, we accidentally discovered a new hotness, like one of those artists came in and did something really cool. Um, an example of that, the meld mechanic from Eldritch Moon. Vincent Prose uh, was one of the artists that came in. He did a great concept plate of two angels fused together in a fairly horrible way. The designer, one of the designers saw that and was like, hey, I've been wanting to do this mechanic where you take two double face cards and they transform and stick together and that's where meld came from. So we're nailing down things constantly, but the sequence is never knowable. Like a lot of our process is again, having enough flexibility to have the confidence that we will get to the answers because we have the right people involved. Um, so the answer is it changes time to time. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, hi, great talk, thank you. Thank you. Um, so my question was similar to his, but a bit more specific, and that was um, at what point in the world building and concept and process do you actually decide on what the individual cards should be? Mm. And then is our, when you go to the talent pool, do you say, I need a piece of art for this particular card, and does it ever work in reverse, i.e. somebody creates a cool piece of art that could be a great card afterwards? Sure, uh, so the way it works, is the world guide is not only for external partners, it is for ourselves. Like, the, again, it is setting us up for success. It's us throwing a pass forward to future us to be able to deliver on the job we need to do. So that world guide um, is used by our writers that we have of Magic RD's creative team. We have artists, we have writers. Our writers, on a card-by-card -card basis, go through, look at the raw mechanical jargon, and say, okay, it costs red, red, it's 2-1, when it comes into play, it destroys an artifact, eh, it's probably a goblin, right? And then they write, you know, an art description that points to concept plates in the world guide and they find a fun and of the world way to represent that concept and then it, and they do that card by card hundreds of them and then the art directors take those card concepts from the writers and hand select which artist is best to paint that goblin who really hates artifacts um, and then we you know get the results and we go through sketches we get feet we give feedback we get to final um, we will work backwards from art sometimes. And when that usually happens is if in development the card changes enough that the piece of art no longer works, we, we have to recommission that. We can't have that, you know, if it's really a, a cognitive disconnect, that's not fun for anybody. But if that art's really great, we'll go ahead and buy it and pay for it and put it in a holding pin and ask designers to find a home for it. Um, our best place to deploy that is currently Commander. Since we don't have a core set, the core set used to use a lot of that. So there are many cards that you guys have seen in Commander products that were art just waiting for a good home that a designer stepped in and heroically rescued. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, I'm curious. Um, with these three-week pushes a couple times a year, I mean, it's great that you treat the artists so well while they're there, but why not just keep them on staff, keep them in-house, keep them working for longer periods of time and yep. give them steady income? Right. Um, so even if, even if someone came to me and said, hey, Jeremy, how would you like a staff of 40 artists? And that's my CEO right there. Hey, Chris, can I have a staff of 40 artists? <laughs> yeah. So, so <laughs> even if that were offered to me, and it has not been, I would still want 
for that, you know, to have a concept push. It is such a creative explosion. Um, it is one of some of the flexibility it offers us as we try to swing that pendulum and keep our settings fresh and off of each other. We have different people working on them people that have different aesthetic values, whose brains work different ways, so you don't get into a, yep, it looks like a magic setting, right? Kaladesh is clearly not Amonkhet, and a lot of that is from the ground up because of that concept push, because different talent was involved. I would still want to bring fresh people in. Like, of those five slots for every concept push, uh, we, we have jobs for those slots usually. Like, we have a, a pace setter, someone that we know is going to work fast so that we don't have to ask people to work fast. They'll just see what that person's doing and be like, oh, shit, I need a helmet faster. Um, but one of those slots is for an X factor, for someone who has been impressing us with card art that we can bring in and see how they are in-house and deliberately to add new ideas, new blood to the process. So I, I really love that flexibility it gives us. And because part of scaling the process, part of why I'm able to flippantly be like, I don't know, we just did it again, um, we did have to staff up. We did have to add a writing resource, an art direction resource. We went from one concept artist to two, but their job is to help us run that flexible process, to help own those concept pushes and world guides so that we can continue to scale them. We have people that know what they're doing, that have been through the process, that can come in and help us own the process and then continue to have a very flexible solution to it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Great. Hi, um, I know you're more creative than design, but I was curious, what are your thoughts on the switch from the one block or one block of three sets per year to the two blocks of two from the design and playtesting perspective? Do you think that that team has encountered similar challenges uh, to scaling up or do you think like that process is pretty much the same? So I, I certainly can't dig down on that. I can, you know, the best I could do is tell you what I hear people complaining about, and I don't want to do that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I can tell you that both teams have had to adjust. Like we both hit, like, you know, it, Magic R&D is full of very, very smart people. And so you can theory craft about what the resulting problems are going to be. You'll hit some of them, maybe even a lot of them. You're not gonna get all of them. The unknown unknowns have bitten us both. I can tell you that. Um, but again, because we're, you know, we are outputting a set every three months, we are able to respond to that and you don't get to slap us twice. We, we'll, we'll figure it out, even if it takes us some iterations. But yeah, doing new things is hard. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hi, with the three weeks to do the concept push and bringing the contractors, the five artists, I just want to know how often or what's your process for reviewing, being able to foresee problems, course correcting, what's okay. that like? So we give that concept push kickoff. Uh, week one is free exploration. Uh, we don't take anything off the wall. We let them put stuff up and talk about it and cross-pollinate. Um, we will. If there's something on the wall that we don't, we don't love and we know it isn't gonna make it through and it starts eking out into other people's work, we will step in and say, hey, let's, let's not, that's enough of that. Like, let's, let's not do this anymore. Um, we do have typically two reviews that first week where we'll talk about, not to talk about what we don't like, what we really try to do is find the stuff that we love, the stuff that we want to see more of, and bless it really loudly so that the artists are able to just do more of the things naturally that we're wanting. Um, in that second week, there are two to three reviews at the wall. Our process is to have the creatives and some of the, uh, the stakeholders, our internal people, talk at the wall, discuss with each other outside of the presence of the artists so they don't hear mixed signals. And then we bring the artist back to the wall and the art director uh, collates that feedback, makes his or her decisions, and the art director is the only voice the artists hear. Um, and third week, we have at least three reviews at the wall as we try to get to a hard stop. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Hi, what are your three favorite or most proud of sets that you've worked on? Oh, you're asking me to pick between my kids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like the one that got a scholarship. Um, <laughs> so, world building 
is I find two different sorts of rewarding. One is when you're working within a known trope space and you're able to really knock it out of the park. I know you guys haven't seen Amonkhet yet, uh, but early on in that arc planning phase, both Sean Main and I were doing some exploration about whether or not there was enough good material to populate all of those cards, right? Because some world premises just don't scale. Um, and it's not based on the depth of the mythology, it's based on the depth of what people know. Um, like, it, the job isn't to make trivia. It's like you, you have to play into what, what is in the, the zeitgeist. And I was like, I, I was really not uh, super positive on the prospects of an Egyptian world. I was like, yeah, it's been done to death. And, uh, and just going through that research phase, just digging down in Google image search, I was like, oh God, no, no one's, no one's knocked this out of the park yet. No one's done this yet. Um, people have played in that space. The best versions actually of Egypt are kind of the sci-fi takes on it, where it's like a really interesting twist on taking the aesthetic and completely recontextualizing it. But so far as taking the mythology itself and delivering an alternate version of it, um, that is really, really fun. To be able to show people a version of something they already like that is just better than what they've seen before, hopefully, and this is me, I'm whatever, I'm being selfish, like, you're like yeah, it's great. Um, Theros is another example of that. That's very rewarding. Um, and also, when you're able to rock a Henry Ford and be like, had I asked the people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. People didn't know that they were going to really like Kaladesh, right? Kaladesh started as we need an artifact set, this is in the product lineup. This is a good home for it. We don't want it to be Mirrodin because Mirrodin's now new Phyrexia and that's kind of off message for what we're doing. So non-Mirrodin artifact set. Um, steampunk, Magic hasn't done that yet. Let's do Steampunk. But it's, you know, it's not gonna be Steam because the game's called Magic, so. And none of that dirty brown stuff. Like I don't want 450 cards of dirty brown rusted metal. So, um, we could, we could set it in India because, you know, of British stuff and steampunk is Victorian. Yeah, but none of the, let's, let's not do that. That whole colonial thing, that's not super awesome for people. So yeah, uh, steampunk that's not steampunk in the Victorian that we stripped all the Victorian out of and gave the veneer of a fantastical India, right? I, I, no one actually emailed me and asked for that. But holy God, it's so much fun and it looks so good. And so it feels really, really good when through our process, we're able to come on something that we haven't, you know, we haven't seen before. There's nothing to, that concept push kickoff document, that presentation was really hard because we could not find any images of what we wanted. Like it just didn't exist. The images we had, <laughs> the starting place of Kaladesh was jewelry was ornate jewelry, and we said, hey, look at that earring, show me a gear made out of that. And then we built a world from those gears. So over-delivering on expectations and delivering on the lack of expectations. Those are, those are my favorite. I know those aren't particular settings, but I'm not, I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, so you've um, talked about sort of the R&D process for the main block releases. Are there similar R&D processes for like, commander sets or um, conspiracy sets? Yeah, yeah, typically they are um, smaller teams, um, but certainly there is always a creative rep on, let, let's take commander for example, there is a creative liaison on commander that is uh, working with them about who the commanders are, what the cards are. Um, commander is for typically a very enfranchised crowd, and so we get to do kind of insightful throwbacks and, oh, let's set this one on Kamigawa and people will get a kick out of that. Um, but yeah, the, the process, it's not as long and often not as structured, but that collaboration is absolutely a part of everything we do. Thanks. Thanks. It was a similar vein to his. I just wanted to see, like, there's a lot of reprints going on with Modern Masters, and I want to know, where do you choose to do different art, and where is the story being told? Like, with Terminate, you see a Sun Titan being destroyed, and then there's a Raised Dead where the Sun Titan is being brought back. Where do you find these arcs, and where do you find to make those? Sure, so when, when I was working on those uh, master sets, or any 100% reprint set, my target for when to, when to there, when you make new art for an existing card, it's one of two things. It's either alt art, 
right? Where it's typically a side grade, we're just making it different, like promos, for example, right? They get alternate art. Um, and then there's facelifts, where there's something that we honestly think we can make better. Um, and so I, I would work with the developers and have them give me kind of a stack rank list of what the most exciting cards were, what were going to be the most meaningful to players to see again, and then pick those that I thought I could honestly facelift and improve um, in a way that people would find exciting. But in, in my opinion, just changing the art for the sake of changing the art doesn't really make people happy. Um, and we actually saw that with uh, From the Vault Legends. All of, all of that art was, was perfectly good to excellent. And it's like, yeah, but part of the value of the SKU is people really like alternate art. And so we arbitrarily changed half of it. I did that, I was told to, and I did it. Nobody liked it. That was for nobody. And so I love to facelift things. I wish we would do less alt art. Uh, one more, like the, when you got the invitational cards were made after the people that created the cards and now you have the new ones which are there, there's a, a vein that people don't like that, where do you, why, why, why is that done as such or is that just because? Uh, why do we take real world people off of cards? Be because it breaks immersion, because it's vanity press and you know, it, the game needs to be for everyone and when you, when you do that, and, and it's nothing against those cards or the people represented on them. It's just, it, it becomes trivia, right? Of who is this and why does it feel a little out of place? And so, you know, n no one's going to show up to people's houses and take their invitational cards away. You get to keep them forever. Um, but as we reprint them going forward, we want it to feel of the time, of the place. And, you know, we, we don't want to cater to too few people with any given decision we, we want, we have a global audience, and we want to do the correctest thing for the most people. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, uh, yeah, this is outside your area, but I'll ask anyway. I was just wondering how much computer simulation you do in playtesting, if any? Uh, I can't answer that. Okay, I thought that could happen. I can tell you that I do zero computer simulation <laughs> when I'm looking at pictures and coloring at my desk. Okay, thanks. <laughs> 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 over here. Hi, thanks so much for uh, uh, disclosing so much. It was pretty cool. Um, a big part of the game itself is the large set versus the small set. And a lot of times, or at least so far, uh, there's a shift in tone. Mm -hmm. uh, how... You know what we literally call that? What? The tonal shift. <laughs> pretty good name. <laughs> you nailed it. Um, how much of the world building three weeks are spent trying to identify uh, the large block versus the smaller block, or do you have a mini cycle that mirrors this development as a follow-up for the small set? It's that follow-up push that typically owns the brunt of that. Uh, we talk about it a lot in our initial world building when we're trying to front load that work of what that tonal shift will be. Uh, for example, in Kaladesh, uh, the skyline has a good deal of amusement park on it, right? Um, in Ether Revolt, it squares off. The buildings change, and that whimsical skyline becomes harsher and more right-angled. Now, we didn't get a lot of that right-angled uh, concept work out of the push prime, out of that first three weeks, but we set up the skyline so that we could A-B it and get those results from the follow-up push. So we think about it early enough that we can set it up with the primary push, and then if we need to, we can pay it off with the follow-up push. Thank you. That's, that's a great question. I didn't know people cared. <laughs> Thanks for a great talk. Um, what are your contingencies, your crisis contingencies? Say you're in week two, week three, and it's really not where you want it to be. How would you handle that? Like the quality is just not. Eh. Well, I, I mean, I'm trying to think of the worst situation we got ourselves into. Like, how, how do you plan for that scenario? Or? We plan for that scenario by having already worked with the illustrators on multiple, multiple things, right? Some of them have been card artists working with us as partners for years before we bring them in-house, right? And we've never had someone, the, the real liability, honestly, because we have a sense of their talent, they've, the reason we bring them in is they've been just smashing stuff out of the park for years for us. Um, the real liability is if someone were to come in and just crumble under the environment and the pressure of, of an office environment. And we haven't had that happen. Um, 
the times when we have found ourselves short or thin in places, it's been our fault. Um, like going back to Shards of Alara, which was, we were working on that in 2006. Um, it was the first full world guide uh, that I art directed. We, we didn't know, like we didn't even have placeholder names for things. Uh, Bant wasn't Bant, it was the white, green, blue house. And we were saying house so we wouldn't say guild because of Ravnica. Um, and Esper, ooh God, Esper was really hard. We knew that every creature there was going to be part artifact, and so we wanted it to be, you know, they replaced parts of themselves, but we hadn't really thought about it because the, the idea at the time was that idea that, like, words are more uh, flexible than pictures are. Let the pictures come first. And uh, Zoltan uh, Boros and Gabor Shiksai came in from Hungary, and I remember at some point they, they just really fixated on it, like it was, it was the thing to solve and they were going to do it. And they worked really hard and it just wasn't working and it wasn't working. And Gabor, who's like, I don't know, 600 feet tall, I remember him coming over to me and he's like, JJ, blue is the big suck. And I was like... <laughs> Yeah, buddy, it is. I know it is. Blue is the big suck. But that was our fault. We hadn't talked about it enough. We hadn't front-loaded enough work. Um, now when people come in, like for Dragons of Tarkir, we're not talking about, okay, there's five two-color dragon clans, and there's going to be a white blue one because they're ally colors, and it's led by, unironically, a white blue dragon. So I don't know. Figure it out. No, we're talking about Ojitai. And it's perfectly reasonable to ask someone to solve for the white blue dragon clan, but it becomes an opportunity when they get to prove themselves and solve for Ojitai herself, right? And that just takes us front-loading the work um, and setting them up for it to be a good experience and a rewarding experience because, to your initial question, I've rambled a little bit, they already have the talent. Now, if someone did come in and choke, we would, we would use the flexibility in the, in the system and just bring in more artists on that backup push. Like, th there have been uh, sometimes if if we scope it correctly and we're like, man, this is, this is a lot for five people, uh, we can just add people to that solution. And I'll walk into Magic's director of operations and be really pitiful and I'll be like, Ken, uh, not gonna be able to do the thing you asked to do, so I need another $5,000 to bring in another person. And Ken will be like, I will give you 10 to shut up and get out of my office. And I'm like, yeah, I work well with people. Um, so, you know, as long as you scope it correctly, you can, you can achieve things. <laughs> All right, that looks like it. Thank you guys, I really appreciate it. <laughs>